Thank you for joining us on the Winning and Selling Podcast. I'm Professor Scott Plum of the Minnesota Sales Institute, and with me is Bill Hellcamp of Reach Development Systems. What do you fear? In the words of our guest, there is another fear that is a stumbling block for all of us. What's more, it is a far more personally destructive fear. I'm referring to the fear of change. Do you fear change? Well, you're about to find out as Scott and I welcome author and sales expert Rob Jollis to episode 474 of the Winning at Selling podcast. Bill, I'm really looking forward to talking with Rob, but first let's talk about our book that we're reading, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey. So if you want to know the habits is patience, you got to wait to hear from Rob. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You threw you off there, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> um, so the, and then the first habit is, is the proactive section. So we're going to cover the first half of the, the, the chapter, pages 66 to 80. This is a a long chapter. They're all long chapters and it's really super concentrated. It's a great start to the seven habits. And I really wanted to be able to chunk it down so that we're able to digest it. And for our listeners to, to really seriously look at this book, read this book, pick this book up, and it'll, it'll really change how you sell, how you interact with people, how you plan your time. And what we're really going to talk about today is, is being proactive and there's a quote by Viktor Frankl, and I think many of us have heard of him. He wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning, a great book. He, Viktor Frankl was a prisoner during World War II, and he said, between stimulus and response, a person is free to choose. And this is the last of the human freedoms. And it's really the difference between responding and reacting. And I, and I love how he talks about the ability to respond ability, our ability to respond. And, and that's what we're in control of. Yeah, I want to go back just a second to something that he talked about, because he talked about determinism. Mm-hmm. And this is the psychological pablum that we've all been given over our lives. And he talked about three different types of determinism that, that we seem to sometimes get involved in. One is genetic determinism, and that is it's your grandparents' fault. Uh, you are what you are based on genetics and you're stuck with it right Mm -hmm. the second was psychic determinism this is your parents fault so your upbringing and and whether your mother spanked you too much or your dad told you you were clumsy uh, you're stuck with that because they they Hmm. determine that for you and then the third is environmental determinism and that is the world is doing it to you so because of your race or because of where you were born or because of the school you went to you're stuck with it And I think that's what he's trying to get away from is this idea that it was other forces in the world that forced you to make the decisions you made because it was either genetic, your parents or the environment that's forcing you to do that. And we need to move away from that. And that's what Frankl was talking about. This freedom to choose says this determinism can be broken if you Mm -hmm. choose to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I can't remember where I read or heard this, but he felt like he had more control over his life than the German guards that were holding him captive Mm. because he could choose how they responded, how he responded to the guards and the guards had to do what they had to do. There there was no option for them. Just a a great position to take when we're in charge of our lives, we're in charge of what we say and and don't say and what we do and we don't do. And that is really a a self-awareness that we have to have. And when we incorporate that into our actions, we are in charge of the outcome and, and we can celebrate the outcome, reward the behavior, celebrate the outcome and, and get what we want by being proactive. Well, and it's very interesting that Frankel made this discovery when everything in his life, when he could go to the bathroom, the clothes mm-hmm. he was going to mm-hmm. wear, what he was going to eat, how much he was going to work, how much he could sleep. All of those things were determined by someone else. His entire environment was being determined by someone else the guards, the prison camp, those sorts of things. The only thing he had was his mind and he chose to be free in his mind and put himself into a different mental place. And I think that so many of us, we allow just little situations. Oh, this person said no to me and now I feel bad and I can't make calls for two weeks or I lost this deal and now Uh, I'm going to let that affect how I respond to everybody, or I'm having a bad morning. I woke up with a backache Mm -hmm. and and all those things are going to then determine what I do rather than me determining it. I 
I've heard this many times from many different speakers. Are you a thermostat or a thermometer? Oh, yeah. yeah, I love that analogy. Do you reflect the situation around you or do you determine the situation with your own choices? Yeah, yeah, that's really a great point. One of the things that he also wrote is what matters most is how we respond to what we experience in life. And it it's important to, you know, I, I always think that when people react, if they were to ever do something that they need to apologize for, it's usually a reaction versus a response. A reaction is emotional, a response is intellectual. And when we're working with prospects, we need to be prepared to respond and, and not for us as salespeople to react, because when we react, we're getting emotionally involved. And our goal is to work with the prospects to get them emotionally involved in that purchasing decision. Because we've all heard that people buy emotionally, they justify mm -hmm. it intellectually. And another line that, that, that he write, writes is, if you wait to be acted upon, you will be acted upon. <laughs> you know, if you wait right. to do something, somebody else would do it before you. So, you know, and I always ask salespeople, you know, describe to me what a perfect week is. And they go, well, you know, it really depends on what happens. It depends mm -hmm. on what customers call or stuff. I go, sounds like you're in customer service. No, no, no. I'm an outside sales rep. And I go, well, you're, you're kind of acting like customer service because customer service is just there to react to everybody's problems. You're a right. salesperson. So if you wait to be acted upon, you will be acted upon and other people will determine your time and how you trade your time. You know, when I was raising two sisters and, and I was 16 and 18 when they were born, I, I told them at a very young age, I said, girls, you have a chance to be a leader or to be a follower. And it, when you're a leader, you're going to take people to a higher place, a better place. When you're a follower, you don't have no idea where you're going. Right. And, and there's, it, it takes a lot of work to be a leader. So choose to be a leader. And both of my sisters are leaders in their industry, in their peer group, and, and people follow them. And I just love this to see where my sisters have taken other people to a much, much higher level. Well, and that's what I'm looking forward to hearing in the rest of this chapter. He starts to talk about the proactive model, shows a picture of what proactive means, and then starts to talk about taking the initiative. And you yeah. need to decide what to do, then move forward. And the initiative says, I don't need the stimulus or the determination to cause me to act. I can choose to act even if it's against what other people think might be the right thing to do. And so that's what really taking the initiative is, deciding what you're going to do, then move forward. So I'm looking forward to the rest of this chapter. Yeah, yeah. It's not too late to start, folks, listeners, uh, to pick up the book, to get caught up. And I think you're really going to enjoy um, the book. This segment of the Winning at Selling podcast is brought to you by The Art of Prospecting, your Guide to Getting in the Door by Steve Cloyda. Steve Cloyda was known internationally for increasing salespeople's ability to make solid appointments with qualified prospects. You too can learn this essential skill by ordering a copy of his superb book, The Art of Prospecting, Your Guide to Getting in the Door. In this book, Steve shares the top strategies and tactics he has developed, implemented, and personally tested with more than one million sales and prospecting calls. You can get his book on the website, theprospectingexpert.com. In addition, check out his other great online resources. Instant Sales Coaching, which will guide you through five online success modules. A guided prospecting process entitled Call Reluctance Transformer. And the Magnetic Selling Strategies Workbook, a detailed step-by-step -step guide to increasing your sales. Get any of these valuable resources at theprospectingexpert.com. Well, Scott and I are very excited to welcome our guest today, Rob Jolis, author of at least six books that I could find, including Customer-Centered Selling, which is a favorite of Scott's, it is. How to Change Minds, The Art of Influence Without Manipulation, and his latest book, Why People Don't Believe You, Building Credibility from the Inside Out. Rob, welcome to the Winning at Selling podcast. Well, I've been looking forward to this. Thanks for having me. You bet. We are just so ha excited to have you on the show. Uh, what I really liked as I've read some of your material is how you write from the viewpoint of the salesperson, uh, trying to help them deal with their, their this chosen profession, or maybe, maybe they didn't even choose it. They got forced into it for some of us, right? But we've been talking about this, this ability with the book uh, to choose what we want to do. And you talked about the fear to change. What is it that holds people back from getting all they want out of this profession? Well, it's a great question. And, you know, through I've, I've sort of gone through my own little metamorphosis as a as a speaker and as a writer. I, I spent a lot of time on 
telling people what to do. Uh, I really doubled back and think I need to do a better job of telling them why we do what we mm -hmm. do. So uh, I think one of the things that holds salespeople back, and it sounds like a cliche, is they really don't believe in their solution. And, um, and, and that is that just kind of is a silent destroyer of just about any salesperson. So the first thing, and it's not just the product, guys, it's, it's twofold. One, I obviously have to believe in this product I'm selling, but I also have to believe in me. I have to believe in the process of selling. I have to realize that, that order taking is not selling. So that mm -hmm. if somebody's calling me and wants a product, I'm really thrilled and happy. But when I take my jacket off and, and, and think what a great day I had, it's when I was able to take and work with somebody who was too afraid to make that change or who didn't think that whatever issue they were looking at was big enough to warrant a change and help them manage through that fear and through that hesitation to a better solution. And when I do that, that's when that's, that really energizes me. And I think salespeople, if they focus on that and really take care of those two things, the product and the process, then selling becomes a whole lot easier and a lot more enjoyable. It seems that a lot of organizations spend a lot of time on that product knowledge, though, even to the to the lack of true sales training. What do you think that balance should be? Oh, I, I, well, I think they have it completely wrong. Whatever they have, flip it. So <laughs> it's usually ninety percent. And I, you know, when I, I I do polls, I don't have a poll on this one, but. They ain't been around, man. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's about 90% uh, product. And if we're lucky, 10% sale, actual sales training. Mm -hmm. Now, if we brought in, you know, a lot of Fortune 500 company CEOs or sales managers, they would say, oh, no, he doesn't know our company. I actually do. I know your company. I, it, it's that a lot of companies are putting on product training and they're calling it sales training. So they bring somebody in like I like me as a New York life agent, wonderful company. Uh, but when I was taught to sell, I was taught what whole life and disability and health insurance and, you know, first dollar accident benefits and uh, and you name it. I got A to Z on that product uh, for each day of my sales training. Right. So um, obviously my instincts were completely off walking out of that office and I just couldn't wait to regurgitate all that knowledge I had because I'd been sales trained. <laughs> so sales training is, is the part about getting people to want your product, getting people to trust the conversation they have, getting uh, creating urgency, all those pieces around the product. That's the sales training. And that's why I say it's about 90 product, 10 sales training. I totally agree with you, Rob. I, I see that often in working with companies. I think another challenge that companies have is that they don't train their salespeople to be problem finders. The salespeople don't know what problems they solve. They're so consumed with the solution, they don't know the application of the solution. And the application of the solution to a problem is defining the value of what a prospect is willing to pay a salesperson to solve a problem or to reach a goal and, and to gain from it. So that, that's another problem. Have you seen that in, in working with companies as they just don't understand what problems they solve? Absolutely. And, you know, if we go back, I think we all, we all tip our hat to the great Neil Rackham mm -hmm. and, and spin selling because Neil was the first person, at least for me, from a book in the late seventies that as a scientist, <laughs> not a salesperson, as a British scientist who really didn't have any skin in the game. He wasn't selling anything. He's just looking at data who said, oh, this isn't my opinion. Uh, it always starts as a problem. People buy based on problems. That's why sometimes I, I feel almost guilty when I get up and I'm doing a seminar and I and, and people are clinging to needs, the concept of needs-based selling, like they're clinging to a, to a security blanket. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to slowly remove that and say, it's a wonderful process. And there's just one thing wrong with the whole needs-based based selling concept, just one. And that is, it's wrong. It's, yeah. That's not right. <laughs> people, needs don't come from heaven. They, they actually start as a problem when the problem becomes big enough they almost do a flip and become a need. And then we jump in, swoop in as salespeople and go, I got a solution with some really nice features and benefits for that, that, that need of yours. But when we want to be proactive, when we actually want to sell something, 
we're not sitting there going, hi, how are you? What do you need? We, yeah. <laughs> we're sitting down there going, well, my job is to is to figure out why I'm here. OK, and, and ask you questions you've never asked yourself and go deep and deep and deep into that problem and maybe find a couple other concerns that aren't even on the radar screen yet, but they will be. And that's what a consultant does. That's what a problem solver does. And when we do that, we help move people to the needs, to the solutions. But uh, last thing, when I do a two-day workshop, I, I'd always my clients are always scratching their head when I go through the agenda and I go, now in these two days of 16 hours of your time with Rob, uh, when we may spend 15 minutes on your solution. And I'm right. going to feel guilty about that, but I have an idea or two. But I will give them the uh, facial expression of almost disgust that I have to talk about your product because that's the easy part. You know, the we're talking about the hard part now. Yeah, they are yeah. so they are so trained. I remember teaching a, a group, and we were doing the same sort of thing, working on questions and driving toward the problem. And, and we talked about you know the the first problem they identify probably isn't the deepest problem. And then we went into uh, case study work, and it was wasn't thirty seconds. They were grabbing their catalogs and starting to show them something. <laughs> right. And it's like, you know, just drive this problem deeper. If they already recognize it as a problem, they've already done an RFP on it, and you're last on the list. If you're not bringing the problems up like you talked about, you're just one of the pack that's trying to solve the problem that they've already identified. You're absolutely right. And you know, Scott, because uh, I know you're a fan of that customer centered selling book. Yeah, yeah, I love um, it. And who wouldn't be? But, but no, seriously, <laughs> folks. Uh, but but there's a there's a story I tell in that particular book of when we train people and when I was trained at Xerox and exercise that I absolutely love because we're 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 here talking about some of the basics too of just asking questions and listening, which I, I can I can feel the audience rolling their eyes sometime. But when I when when I bring it up, but I will tell you that I don't bring it up when I'm doing a seminar. What I do is I put them in pairs, tell them to break out your smartphones and go sell something, anything you want. Give me at least five minutes. Don't need more than seven. And then I tell a little white lie and I tell them because I want to look at your style because style is mm. real important. And they go, OK, and off they go. And when they come back, I just change the conversation to let's forget that I that, that tape for a minute. Just describe somebody that you respect, that you like, that you have seen sell and, and tell me about them. They go, oh, they, they make the customer feel at ease. They, 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 they create trust. They, they display honesty. They, they get the customer to, to feel comfortable with them. And then I say, okay, how do you think they're doing that? I mean, what are they doing? Give me a process behavior. Make it measurable. And, we, and I have to usually pull it out of them, but we do agree on the fact that, well, they listen and ask questions uh, because the more the client talks, the more they like us. Well, everybody goes, yep, okay, yeah, I'm with you. I go, good. Now go back and play your tapes again and just count every question that you asked and every statement that you made. And that's how you teach a salesperson about asking questions and listening. If you hook up a salesperson to a lie detector and say, now, are you asking questions and listening? They'll tell you yes. And the needles won't move. <laughs> it, 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 the, the lie detector won't catch it because they believe they're doing it. Yeah. You actually have to record it. You have to show them. And, and, and part B of that is there's always a couple wise guys that'll go in my five minutes, I asked 27 questions, which they did. And that's very good. But then we have to make the second point of the second oldest lesson, which is good. But how do you ask 27 questions in five minutes? And I'm assuming the client is speaking. Was it an interrogation or a conversation? And now we land on the value of open probes versus closed. Yeah. I got to tell you, last thing, and I'll jump off this soapbox, but I'll spend 16 hours with you. If you walk out committed to asking questions and listening and knowing how to where and how to intelligently ask open probes, and you do that for the rest of your career, you just had the best sales training program you will ever attend. Mm, yeah. Now, I might be mistaken, but I didn't hear you say anything about your 15-minute company pitch that marketing has <laughs> already yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, we got to make compliance happy yeah. too now, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I carry it with me. I don't show it to anybody. <laughs> you, you were talking about style earlier, Rob, and, and I can't remember if you wrote this in the book, and, and I read your book back in 2004, and uh, I just, I, I loved it. And I can't remember if you wrote this in the book or I've, I heard it from someplace else is that, 
each salesperson has their own style. However, they can all follow the same process. Is that something that I read in your book? Well, if you if you didn't, I'd claim you did anyway. But okay. uh, right. yeah, yes, absolutely. yes, you did. Yes, you like, did. That's right. <laughs> no, because because truly, after you take an audience and you and you basically deceive them, aren't Rob workshops nice? Yeah. Um, after you deceive them, but make your point. I always cap it off with, so let's talk about style, but the good news is we can do it in about 60 seconds. I think, uh, and, a, and a proof source that I love to bring up, a man who's no longer with us, the great Ben Feldman, who mm. just lit the insurance industry up. He just put it on his back. He, he tripled what a quarter of a million other salespeople were doing year after year in terms of volume from the sprawling metropolis of East Liverpool, Ohio. And mm. what he taught us amongst other things was he didn't possess one characteristic that you would see in a stereotypical salesperson physically, uh, but he was a master. And what we can, when we show a person who uh, maybe a little bit on the, the large side, they get kind of hair like Larry on the three stooges, mm. had a little bit of a lisp going, not, 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 not quite the Alec Baldwin character that we saw in Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what we can look at and say, now, if this person, because he was true to himself, his style, what he had, if this person could actually be, by the numbers, the greatest salesperson who ever lived, tell me which one of you in this audience right now uh, where your style won't work. So you're right, Scott. What we did was we began to tell, pe tell people, nobody does you better than you. Now let's take some repeatable, predictable processes that are measurable and let's learn them and stylize them. Mm -hmm. And that's how we put those two together. Yeah, I yeah. think so many salespeople are worried about, oh, you're giving me a canned approach. It's like, well, sometimes we have to learn it in a canned way and then we can build on it later with our own personality, but at least learn something that you can use so then you can change it and adapt it. Well, I just wrote a piece on that. Actually, it came out um, last Friday called The Truth About Sales Scripts. So it's funny you bring that up. I, I, um, I went both sides on that. I mean, it's easy now in you know 2021 to go, my humbug, those sales scripts, can you believe what they used to do? Where are the orange leisure suits? <laughs> uh, and yet, there's an argument for both sides. So the, the real problem with a sales script is obviously I'm having trouble getting my authentic, my authentic self in there. Right. I think one of the problems is that sales managers don't know how to use a sales script. Meaning, how about we use a sales script this way? We've created a document that's going to really articulate the most difficult parts of the sales process, not say that necessarily sales process, but your product and some objections and, and things that are difficult to clarify. We're going to do that for you. And then we're going to punish you and we're going to make you memorize it, okay, <laughs> uh, as a rite of passage, if nothing else. And then we're all going to take, put our hand in the air and promise we will never read this script back to a customer. But what we're going to do is we're going to create little, well-articulated landing spots. And we're going to use it as, as a source that way. We're not going to go from beginning to end. You see, unfortunately, most companies, they don't know how to use the sales script. So they use it as a weapon. It, it uh, demotivates the sales force. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it, it makes them, I, I, as a sales trainer, it breaks my heart when you train somebody and they're angry for you training them. Mm -hmm. You want them to be excited about it. So, but if they understand, how about I just... I just show you the best way of saying certain things. Yes, you can stylize it to an extent. Promise me you'll never read it back, but you will be shocked at how many times you're going to be in the field, backed into a corner with a difficult question, and out comes this really great answer that you memorized a year and a half ago. So let's just use it that way, and then we, can, we, we don't have to be so angry at sales scripts. I like to call them sales guides so they can kind of yeah. guide the conversation and still keep your authenticity in there. And I think one of the things that salespeople struggle with when they get focused on a script is that they don't listen and they don't think about that follow-up question. And if your questions are open-ended, you really have to listen to really the intent behind the content. So what is that prospect really saying when they say that? What do they really mean when they say that? 
Uh, one of the great lines out of your book, and, and, I, and I keep thinking about it every time I, I do a class, is people don't fix small problems, they fix big ones. And that is just one of the powerful lines in the book that I think salespeople really lose focus on um, when they're working with, with prospects. Um, what are some of the other lines in the book that really resonate with what message you want to communicate to salespeople? Okay. Well, first of all, I don't want to run through that step sign, that stop sign, because I, I'm smiling as an author and you, you know, you put together 225 pages or whatever, and then mm -hmm. you get on the conversation with somebody who pulls probably the most important line out of the book out and presents it to you as a present. Um, so thank you for that. That is a very important piece. It's, it's why those follow-up questions exist. It's why we have to take people deeper into a problem because well, here's a, you, you asked for lines. They'll just sort of pop out of me. Yeah. But one line I have in my head is if clients are so smart about the problem, why haven't they fixed it already? <laughs> exactly. Right? And the answer is because it doesn't hurt badly enough. Right. And we want to go running down, you know, features and benefits alley so fast. We forget that it's, and, and this is sort of my newer stuff, but I, I have to convince people that, when you ask the tougher questions and you go deeper into an issue, it's not mean, it's merciful. It is one of the kindest things you can do because believe me, when it becomes a big problem and it, and at what cost, by the way, mm -hmm. yes, they'll find religion. They will go ahead and cross that line. What, what a wonderful occupation for us to have. Will you possess the skills to save people from that pain, to be able to get them up to, and it's not easy, to take them through an issue so that they fix it, so that they're proactive. It's amazing. Um, so I, I wish salespeople would embrace what they do and realize that, you know, not all lawyers are great, but some of them are really good and we need people to interpret the law. And some doctors aren't great, but some are really good because we need people to take care of us. Some salespeople aren't, people aren't so hot and many of them are amazing because we need people to move us past that fear of change, which was how we started this conversation. All right. You want some other quotes from Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, out of the year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's delve into some of your other books or one of your okay. other books. I, I cut my teeth as a Dale Carnegie trainer. So I was really intrigued by your book, How to Change Minds, The mm -hmm. Art of Influence Without Manipulation, because that manipulation question was something we used to get a lot when we taught Dale Carnegie was to say, well, aren't you trying to make people do things for you? So what is this influence without manipulation and how can we help people change minds? And, and not everyone's a salesperson in name, but, but, but also, but they are in fact. Great. A uh, great question. And, and I, I go back to uh, the book that Scott has, you know, we authors, we write a book, we feel really good about it. And then uh, the publisher says, yeah, we feel good about it too. So Simon and Schuster was pushing me for another sales book. And the, the weird part is uh, I, I wrote a second edition, Scott, you should get that one, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I do it, have it. But, but I can tell you with a smile, I know the first line of the second edition, it goes like this. I haven't changed my mind. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a there's a sports cast you may have heard him from Washington D.C. called Tony Kornheiser. He wrote a very successful book, and the publisher was after him. And, and Tony, who's a, a, a satirical writer, his second book was called Going Back for More Cash. So, <laughs> so I wanted to avoid that. That's how I'm winding up into where we're going. And so I did. I wanted to take it from a different angle. I wanted to talk to people. Um, who aren't necessarily natural salespeople, but sales managers and parents and just people out there that need the skills of persuasion. And they are so petrified of being manipulative that they don't even like hearing the word selling. We, we have to find other words. I'm going to sa right, say right. things to you. I influence you. Uh, we, we, we dance around a word. Well, shame on us. But so that book, uh, to answer your question, to me was... Let's spend some time. We'll get to the sales process that obviously I'm very excited about, but we, everybody, we deserve a conversation about what separates influ influence from manipulation and kind of track a running total as we go and explain what I was mentioning earlier about why we have to ask uh, more difficult questions. Because 
Uh, Bill and Scott, we have to put this on the table. Persuasion isn't always pretty. It isn't mm-hmm. always pretty. I, I, it, it mm-hmm. hurt. It, it, you have to ask questions and people will not be smiling at many of the questions. I can ask you where you went to camp and that's an easy one. But when I ask you what, what are some of the limitations of this particular issue, particularly when it's affecting this percentage of your client base, most people don't smile and go, well, we could be out of business soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I know I'm going to ask questions that won't be easy. And yet, that, so I wanted to write a book that, that, that took a look at that wound and treated that wound and cleaned that wound and bandaged that wound. So we understood that wound. So we're no longer afraid to do what it takes courage to do, which is to earn the right to be able to ask the more difficult questions mm. and then go deep when those questions and finish. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on fantasy Island here. And finish with a client looking you in the eye, extending their hand and thanking you for that conversation. Uh, And they will. So again, not mean, merciful. Rob, I'm kind of curious, who are some of the people that you follow or who you are inspired by? And and I always love the question, how do you inspire the inspirer? So you're out there inspiring salespeople. Where do you get your inspiration? Who do you follow? That's interesting. Uh, You know, I followed my dad for so long. Um, and just admired him and, and learned from him and, and, and watched him. And, you know, you had a conversation about leaders and leadership and watched him lead. Um, And so he was my key mentor and um, he passed. uh, I actually couldn't tell you when, because I refused to acknowledge the date or year, Mm -hmm. but I would say uh, 10 ish years ago. So uh I, I I follow, you know, I really admire Neil Rackham. I've had the, the pleasure and opportunity to meet him a few times. And um, I just enjoy those conversations with him because I really think I feel like we're talking to the forefather yeah, of, yeah, of so really new or selling, you know. And um, so Rackham would be one. Uh, there was a, a, a man, um, boy, I hope he hears this because I don't speak about him enough, but it was a great question. So you had me thinking mm. a man uh, at Xerox named Larry DeMoncus and Larry DeMoncus was my, uh, taught me to sell. I quote him in the book a few times. One of my, one of my favorite Larry DeMoncus quotes has always been, and, and my name is pronounced Jollis, by the way, but he never got it right. So I always hear it in my head, Joel's, if they cry, they'll buy. <laughs> and and you know we've had to soften that up a little bit through the years to be conventionally you know appropriate but but larry demoncus was was a, an amazing trainer an amazing salesperson and a really good friend he, he lives he's retired down in the carolinas and um every now and then i i i send him shoot him an email whatever and i i just admire him a great deal and i'm i don't say it enough so i'm glad you asked me the question mm, good good Good. Thanks for being with us, Rob. There's a lot of great information. Uh, Rob, any last words that you want to leave for our audience? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I would say um, the last words I want to leave with you are, are this, and I'm just going to touch back on one of the themes that we hit. Take pride in what you're doing. Understand how important you are to not just your clients, to your family, to your friends, because you possess the skills to help people move get moving, make difficult decisions. And that is a skill set that is valuable and take pride in it and enjoy the journey. Rob, can you tell people about your podcast? Well, yeah, uh, my podcast, I'm, I'm fumbling and bumbling around like a lot of <laughs> podcasters out there, but I decided, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll jump in. So I'm crawling before I walk, walk before I run. It's called Pocket Size Pep Talks. And I'm still learning my, my, my what you guys do. But I'm getting better at it. My my problem is I've been interviewed a thousand times and I don't usually do the interviewing. So all of a sudden I got to be quiet and get back to asking the questions again. But uh, I'm enjoying but you know that. how to ask questions, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? That's the, the beauty of, of working virtually. We can put signs up, can't we? Yeah. So I got a nice sign with the uh, with a, with the word shut up yeah. on it. <laughs> Yeah. And Rob, if you've got a couple of resources, perhaps for our listeners, you mentioned that article that you did on scripts. Uh, Perhaps you want to give us a link to that or links to your books. Uh, We'll put those in our on our website, winningatselling.com. Scott, you have a couple of offers. 
Right. Yeah, I've been, uh, I, I have returned to the real estate industry. I started my sales career at 21 selling real estate. And now I've returned to the real estate industry and I'm working on coaching and developing agents. So if you're in real estate and you want better results, but you're not sure how to get there, or you want to uncover some barriers, let's, let's talk. Um, you can reach me at the, the podcast website, winning at selling.com. And then I'm not going to make an offer this week because I filled up my calendar with people who want to have me do the presentation, three keys to closing more sales. So I actually ended up doing four of those, even though I said I was only going to do three. So I'm looking forward to helping our listeners through these presentations. Scott, you have a golden nugget for us. To yeah. Up with. Our, our golden nugget today is from Albert Einstein. The significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. And I think we've all heard that one before. We just have to be reminded about it. So sometimes we need to seek help from other people to solve the problems that we've created. And I think reading good books like Rob's books, like uh, Seven Habits, that's where we get new ways to solve old problems is by going with people who are out there and making significant contributions as Rob has. So go to uh, winningatselling.com. All of that information, links will be there. So look for it at winningatselling.com. Next week, we're going to finish chapter one, habit one on being productive. So we'll go from um, the second half, starting with the, the circle of influence. And our topic is going to be on sales implementation. So after the sale, now we're implementing the solution. We're going to be covering how to do that. Go out and get better one skill at a time. Joyful selling. Joyful selling.